Welcome back everyone, Dan Vega here, and today we are talking about a Java project called Lombok. So Project Lombok is going to help us reduce a lot of the boilerplate code that we write, especially when it comes to data classes or Java beans, things like that. And we're going to actually use this in a Spring Boot application, uh, and it's really easy to get going. Uh, there's actually an option for it on our Spring Initializer steps, so that makes it really easy. And I'm going to include the documentation uh, with this video, but I think the easiest way to understand what Lombok is is to really just go through a demo and see how much time it really saves us here. So let's go ahead and create a new project. And I'm using Java 1.8, we're using the Spring Initializer here. And we're gonna call this Lombok. And I'm gonna go ahead and change my group. Again, this is a Java project, version 1.8. So here I'm gonna just change this, just because this is the boot, boot version I've been using lately. And right here in the core section, there's our project Lombok. So we're gonna go ahead and select that and you'll see if we kind of hover over this um, come on there you go so java annotation library which will help reduce boilerplate code and code faster so we're going to choose that we're going to actually choose web as well i'm also going to choose spring data gpa and we're going to use h2 and I think that's all we need, so let's go ahead and hit next. We have our project Lombok. Let's go ahead and finish. All right, so the first thing we're gonna come in and look at our project here. So we have our source main Java. This is our Spring Boot app. This is nothing special going on here. This is what a normal Spring, Spring Boot application looks like. Uh, what I'm gonna do is come in and actually create a new package and we'll call this package uh, domain. And inside of that domain, I'm going to create a new class. Oops. Let's call that, um, let's call it user. So we're going to have a user class here. And let's go ahead and create some fields. So don't worry if you don't know anything about Spring Data GPA, but let's just say I was setting up an entity here. So let's say I am creating an entity. Uh, entity. And this is going to have an ID. And this is going to be an ID and generated value. And all right, now we're going to create some properties in this class, right? So we might have things like first name, we might have last, we might have email, we might have, um, let's say, an age. Actually, we could probably just calculate that. Let's say a date. And maybe we have a Boolean. Uh, maybe we have an active flag. So these are all our different properties that our user domain object is going to hold. So this is a regular data class, right? We There's nothing, there's no kind of business logic going on here. It's really just holding properties of a domain object and to kind of finish this out now, what we would need is we would need to create, so the way JPA is, it needs a private no arg constructor. So we would create a no arg constructor and that would satisfy JPA. But what we'd also have to do is we'd have to come in here and we need to generate a bunch of things, right? We need, um, we need getters and setters for all of our properties here. So we could write that out by hand, but that would be really awful. Uh, what we can do is actually use the ID to generate these. So let's say I want to generate getters and setters. I want to actually generate those for all of those fields in my class here. So I'm going to select them all, click OK. Now I got all of those getters and setters. But what I also might need is uh, we should have an equals and hash, co hash code method. So let's go ahead and use that. I'm just going to select this. Um, let's say we're just using those. Again, I'm trying to keep this pretty simple here. So, so now we have some equals and hash code methods. Now what else would we need? Maybe we might need a two string. So we come in here and use that. Now we have a two string. 
So now we have this class that has just a few fields. We've generated everything we kind of need for this representation of a user, but we're at 109 lines, 108 lines here. That's pretty crazy for just something that's going to be so minimal as just a data access object, right? We're really just using this to represent a single user. Well, we can get away from this, and I, I've been doing Groovy for a long time, and that's one of the things I really like about Groovy is it'll actually generate user, uh, getters and setters for you. You can use annotations for things like equals and hash code or two string or et cetera. So let's go ahead and get rid of all this boilerplate code and clean up this class. So we're actually going to keep our private NOR constructor. And all we're going to do, because we selected Lombok, if we go back to our Maven POM file, because we have Lombok here, we have that dependency in our project, we can just go ahead and add at data, and that's Lombok, and save it. Now if we go over to our structure here and look at what is in our particular user class, we can see that we have all of these things. So we have our user constructor. We have get and set for all of our properties. You can see we have a two string. We have a can equal hash code equals etc. So just by adding that project Lombok, adding the at data annotation on top of our user class, we now have all of those methods that that we had to generate before. And you may say, like, what's the difference between me adding an annotation and me adding, you know, generating all of these particular methods? Well, the big problem is if you generate all of those methods, and those methods are all relying on what properties you want to give them, right? So when you generate a toString, you, you may want the toString to represent everything that's in this particular class. Well, if at any time any property changes, you need to go regenerate either all of those or which ones are miss missing or which ones you've added. So it becomes a maintenance nightmare and I just don't like it. It's not a lot of fun. It's not the code you want to be writing, right? I mean, this is just getters and setters and, and boilerplate code and we want to reduce that. So that really does that for us. Um, if we're not quite sure, you know, we still can't see those methods in there. So how can we be positive that that's doing its job? Well, one thing we can do is we can go ahead and I'm, I'm in the project here. So let's go ahead and fire this up. And I just want to do this so uh, these get compiled. And so that's going to go ahead and run, but I don't really care about that. I want to actually look at target classes. Where is it? Com. All right, so now if we look in that actual output folder, so that's an actual class, right? If we jump in there, this is the actual domain class that was compiled for us. We can use Java P, which will basically deconstruct our class file and show us what's inside of there. So if we go Java P user, we can get an idea of what's in there. So we see all of our properties. We see all of our getters and methods that are in there. We see our equals, our hash code, and our two string. So we can be sure that that is doing exactly what it needed to do. Now, there's one more use case. Maybe you don't want getters and setters and all of those other methods. Maybe you don't need a hash code and equals for whatever reason. If you just want getters or setters for particular fields, you can use the getter and setter um, annotations and not the data one and just get the getters and setters for a particular class. So if we come back into the structure now, we see that we only have getters and setters for that first field. And so that's how that kind of works. But I mean, most of the time I just come in and use data and that's good to go. So I think that's where we're going to leave that. I, again, I will link to the documentation. There's, there are more annotations that you can use. These are probably the most ones, the, the, the common ones that I use a lot. Um, but again, that's Project Lombok. You can include it right in your Spring Boot app by just checking something right on that Spring Initializer. And it's a very, very helpful 
project that really helps us save some time by reducing the boilerplate code that we're writing. So I hope you enjoyed that. If you did, please give me a thumbs up, subscribe to this channel, and let me know what you think. Thanks, guys.